recently watched a fascinating documentary called Try Harder. And it was about <clears throat> this school in San Francisco that is the top public school. Uh, you only get into it if you apply for it and just the cream of the crop throughout that entire large metro area make it into this. Uh, <clears throat> one student explained that the pressure was incredible. They talked about how at their own schools before coming to this high school, Lowell High School, uh, they were considered smart. They were the person that everyone else looked up to and you got there and suddenly you were just average or often even below average. The pressure of competition was very much stressful. Uh, all of them, when graduating, were applying to elite schools. Stanford was the number one pick overall because it's in California and is an excellent school, has a 4% acceptance rate. Uh, UC uh, Berkeley is the kind of second top choice for many. And then others look to the East Coast, the Ivies we'd expect, the Harvards, Princeton, Yale, Brown. But the problem they were explaining is that um, most of these schools only want one person from a high school. In other words, you know, Harvard doesn't want 10 kids from one school. It kind of looks bad to do that. In addition, Lowell High School is a vast majority Asian, especially Chinese and Taiwanese, seem to be where many of them came from, their parents. And uh, once again, the schools did not want too many Asian students. So the pressure was very high to be the one that they selected. So they were all battling for the same positions. But the senior class president, who was Chinese by background, was uh, liked by almost everybody. Uh, when people were talking about him, repeatedly you heard the word genius. Uh, students would say, ah, he's a genius. Uh, one of the teachers said, he's a genius. Matter of fact, they showed his uh, physics professor, and it's AP physics. Those of you who have kids who are younger know that AP are the top classes. And, so AP Physics, he's grading his exam. At the end, he gives them 100 on it and says, I guess I need to make harder tests for him. So, uh, but this guy's a brain, but at the same time, he's gifted. He showed him playing violin, and he's playing a classical piece with someone else. They're doing this duet, and it was amazing. And the violin teacher says he's one of the five best violin players we've ever had here. And she said, and that's saying something. Well, on top of that, he's just a nice guy. People liked him. One of the students kind of gave insight into maybe why he was so likable. Um, he had a quiz or a test. I don't remember which it was. Again, I'm just watching a documentary. I'm not planning to speak on it. But it's either a quiz or a test that he got a zero on. And the student explained the zero was deliberate. The class was on a curve. And if those of you who've been on a curve know, whoever's at the top if they're way at the top, if they have a perfect score, everyone else does worse. So you don't want the top person to do too well because your grade will be worse. So he was so far on the top that he realized he could get a zero and he'd still get an A in the class. And everyone else would get a better grade. And so he was just one of those people that others liked. Now the documentary followed the students as they applied to these schools. Again, Stanford, everyone there pretty much applied to Stanford. And early acceptance is something that you do that you have a better chance of getting accepted if you do early acceptance. You're committing, I'll go to Stanford if you choose me. Nobody from Lowell High School was chosen, and they were all devastated. Uh, later on, one would be chosen, uh, maybe others, but we know of at least one that got in. But they would just show them, the documentary would show them in school, and they would be, you know, looking back in the old days, we got letters in the mail, remember that, like, you know, you're accepted. Uh, now it's like you go on to an app that, the, you know, Harvard has, or they send you an email, and they would just be reading to the camera, you know, oh, I got it, and they were like, you know, due to the large number of students enrolled, we're sorry to tell you that you were not accepted, not accepted, not accepted. You know, Harvard, Yale, Brown, Princeton, just again and again, Berkeley, all of these schools. And the students kind of laugh it off, oh, it's fine, but you could tell it really wasn't fine, and it was very hard for them. Uh, but the class president got his uh, notice when he was at the beginning of a class. So before classes started, and I guess the documentarian just had the camera rolling, and so uh, he pulls it up and sees that he was accepted to Harvard. And what was neat was to see the students around. Again, the jealousy there is just terrible because they're all fighting for these positions. Many of them have parents who have set an expectation for them. But the students were genuinely happy for this guy who just was really a good guy. And I was impressed because I'm sure it wasn't easy for them to do that. But it was the right way for them to react. You know, the Bible says that we are to rejoice 
with those who rejoice. But that's not always easy to do. It's tough to rejoice with someone when you're failing. You know, if they got an A on the test and you got a C, it's pretty hard. You're like, oh, that's great. I'm so happy for you. I'm really not. I'm jealous and I wish you'd done, right? right? Don't you wish, when you get a C, you hope everyone else got a C, right? I, I remember my parents, my, my, they were both teachers. So you, first of all, my dad taught in our high school. So he pretty much knew what was going on. And I remember those saying like, but nobody did well on that test. And he'd always say, I didn't ask you how everyone else did. I asked you how you did. It's hard to rejoice when everyone else does well. It's hard to rejoice when someone else gets a promotion and you are passed over. It's difficult to rejoice when someone else has started a new relationship and they're so happy and you're feeling alone. It's hard to rejoice when someone talks about how amazing their marriage is and yours is struggling. How do we rejoice with others? Romans chapter 12, 14 to 17 contains some radical and revolutionary teaching about relationships. We read this in verse 14. Paul writes, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Now to bless someone is to ask God to bestow his favor on them. To bless is far more than to not retaliate. Christians are to actively seek the best for their persecutors. Now, the truth is, as Christians in the United States, we have not typically experienced much in the way of persecution. It would be more like, yeah, okay, maybe people don't like us sometimes, but I'm telling you, as our culture changes, persecution will become stronger. I don't think any of us are going to be killed for our faith, um, probably won't be harmed because of what we believe, but we will certainly be reviled by many. There will be people who will dislike us simply because we are Christians who follow Christ's teaching. So how will we respond to them? Well, Paul says here twice, bless. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Biblically, when something is repeated, it's to emphasize. Kind of it's underlined, bolded. And passive acceptance of persecution is not enough. It's not enough to simply withhold retaliation. We're to take a proactive step and bless them. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. So we're to go beyond simply like not hating them. And we're called to love them. We're called to pray for them. You know, Jesus on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. John Piper says this, if we're going to be treated unjustly and even hurt unjustly for Christ's sake, and yet bless our adversaries and pray for them, then our natural obsession with self-preoccupation and self-exaltation must die. It must be replaced by Christ's preoccupation and Christ's exaltation. That's what faith is, embracing the all-satisfying treasure of Christ. So it's not enough to just not like, you know, okay, I'm not going to do anything against them. I'm not going to retaliate. We, we are to care about them, but that's only going to happen if Christ has filled us, if he is the most important thing in our lives. If his Holy Spirit is filling us, then we can bless those who persecute us. Verse 15, he continues, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. So again, those students at Lowell High School to rejoice with their class president. He got into Harvard even though they got rejection after rejection after rejection. That's what we're called to do, though, is rejoice with those who are rejoicing. But it's difficult. You know, it's often easier to be caring towards someone who's struggling. You know, if we have a friend who's hurting, it's easier to put our arm around them, you know, and I'm, I'm sorry, and, you know, I really hurt with you. Maybe even to cry tears with them as they're going through something deeply painful. It's easier to pray for them than it often is to rejoice when someone has something that we wished. If you're invited to a wedding, but you're single, desperately wishing you were married, or again, maybe you're divorced and remembering that day for you, or maybe you're alone and you just wish that life were different. It can be hard to celebrate with people who have what you don't. It's not always easy to rejoice with others, but it's the right thing to do. The problem is we start to compare ourselves to them. We start to think, why did they get this? Why do they deserve that? You saw that at the high school in the documentary, that there was some kind of like, well, why did this student get in? 
but God calls us to rejoice with others. It's difficult, though. We, again, envy rears its ugly head. You know, you look at the National Football League. Um, different positions get paid different amounts of money. So quarterbacks, they get the most. Um, wide receivers also tend to get a good amount of money. Running backs, the, uh, offensive linemen, they're just not going to get paid. Now, again, not paid that well. Like, they only made $3 million last year. You know, it, it'd be hard to live off $3 million, but I think I could adjust my lifestyle. But still, in the NFL, there is real jealousy among positions if someone gets paid more than you do. So with quarterbacks, all of the time you see that there's a quarterback who just set a new record for getting paid the most, and their contract's amazing. And they're so happy. They've got their, you know, 20 cars and three mansions, and they're living it up. And then they discover that someone else just got a new contract for even more. And they're not rejoicing now for the other quarterback. Man, that's so great. He deserves it. They're saying, well, I want to renegotiate my contract. I need more. And the sad thing is, for many of us, we have the same thing. We compare ourselves with others. And so when we're called to rejoice with those who rejoice, it doesn't mean it's always going to be easy. But if someone's celebrating, then we should find joy with them. Well, the other side of this is that we're also to mourn with those who mourn. The word mourn means to shed tears and to lament loudly. Literally, this could be translated, rejoice with the rejoicing ones, weep with the weeping ones. Are you able to empathize with someone who's hurting? Are you care, do you care about someone who's brokenhearted? Does your heart go out to them, or do you maybe think that they got what they deserved? Maybe they're hurting because of their bad choices. Now, there are times in the midst of that that we then need to speak truth into people and just say, like, hey, you know, if you keep doing this, it, it's going to lead to pain. But if someone's hurting, rather than pointing fingers at their failures, we need to first come to them with love and first mourn with them. If we're going to rejoice with someone when they're happy, we need to get rid of our jealousy. If we're going to mourn with those who are hurting, we need to judge, jettison any judgmental spirit that we have. Instead of being indifferent to the emotions of others, we are called to be empathetic. It's been said that a sorrow that's shared is half the trouble. And a joy that is shared is joy made double. I love the Apostle Paul, his heart that he had for others. He says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Who is weak and I do not feel it? Weak. Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? In other words, when people are struggling, he feels for them. They're weak. They're, they're having, he, he cares about them. They're struggling with a sin. His heart burns for them. Paul cared about them, and we're called to do the same. In a world that couldn't care less, we're called to care more. The story is told of a little boy whose next-door neighbor's wife had died. And this elderly man one day was just outside sitting alone and clearly sad, and the little boy went over to him and sat down next to him. When he came back over, his mom said, what did you guys talk about? And the boy said, nothing. I just helped him cry. That's what we're called to do, to mourn with those who mourn. You know, Job's friends did that. If you know the story of Job in the Bible, he loses everything. And for seven days, his friends come and just mourn with him. And it wasn't until they opened up their mouths and then started pointing fingers at him that they did poorly. But that first week, they, they were just there with him. We're to do the same. I'm convicted by the words of a commentator who wrote, to refuse to rejoice with another reveals envy in your heart. To refuse to weep with another is a, to reveal a lack of compassion in your heart. Either way, you have a serious heart problem. So do you rejoice with people who are rejoicing? If not, you need to look at your heart because something is not right in here. Are you able to mourn with those who mourn? Or is it just an inconvenience? Like, ah, I'm just not really into emotions. Sorry, just don't do well with them. I don't care if you do well or not. God's called you to minister to those who are hurting. His Holy Spirit will equip you with what you need if you'll allow him to. Well, if we're going to do all these things, if we're going to rejoice with those who rejoice, if we're going to mourn with those who mourn, we're going to need to be humble. Verse 16, Paul says, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. The Greek for harmony literally means think the same thing towards one another. 
Acts chapter 4, we're told that the believers were of one heart and mind. And that's this idea that we're to have. Later in the book of Romans, Paul will say this in chapter 15. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus. So God is looking for people who are united, who live in harmony with one another, caring for each other. And he warns us here about being haughty. Do not be proud, but we'll be willing to associate with people of low position. The phrase here, be willing to associate, means to be led along or carried along. That they're people that you are willing to be around. The phrase low position describes those who've been flattened by life, those who've been knocked down. There are people who've been pummeled with problems. They're hurting, and you know what? They're not going to make you look better. You know, we learn in school, like, you, you want to always be around people who make you look better, right? Like, in high school, you kind of learn, like, if you can be with cooler people, it bumps you up a little bit. As Christians, that's not what we're to be about. There is no caste system in Christianity. We're to care about everyone. Paul warns us against being conceited because there's no place for conceit in Christianity. The tense of this reads, do not have the habit of being haughty. So, has it been a while since you've gotten off your high horse? Do you feel like you're better than other people? Are you living in harmony with those around you? Because that's what God's calling you to do. Verse 17, Paul continues, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. And this warning goes against our nature. I mean, we just want to repay someone. They do something to us, we want to pay them back. It reminds me of a story about Jack and his little sister. Jack's mom hears him screaming in his room, and he runs in to find her two-year-old daughter pulling on his hair, and she grabs her fingers and takes them out, and, and she says to Jack, like, you got to understand, your sister, she, she doesn't know what she's doing. She didn't know that that hurts. And she left the room, and just literally a few seconds later, she hears the daughter crying. And the mom came back in now and says to Jack, what happened? He said, she knows now. Well, is there someone you'd like to pay back today? Is there someone you would like to hurt because they hurt you? Here's the deal. Don't retaliate when you've been wrong. 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul writes this. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. It's easy to want to repay, but God calls us to be kind to one another. Why should we resist repaying a wrong? Proverbs 30 says this. For as churning the milk produces butter, and as twisting the nose produces blood, so stirring up anger produces strife. You know, back then we don't obviously churn our butter. Anyone here ever churned butter before? Oh, okay, a couple people churned butter, okay. Um, I've seen it done, you know, like we went to one of those historic places where they've got like this large kind of thing, and you churn the butter. And if you do that to milk and the cream will rise, eventually it becomes butter. That's just what's going to happen. If you grab someone's nose and twist it, it will bleed. And believe me, I know I've broken my nose three times. You twist the nose, it starts to bleed. That's what's going to happen. You shouldn't be shocked when it does. And in the same way, this proverb saying, stirring up anger produces strife. There are people who stir and stir and stir, and then they're shocked when someone gets mad at them. I have a friend, some of you guys know Francois from our church, and uh, Francois's wife, Denise, she's a city girl from the Bronx, and Denise has a sense of humor, but there are just times you don't mess with Denise. She's a city girl, and, uh, and Francois would just love to tease her. And I would always tell him, it's poking the bear. And, you know, you poke a bear, and you poke a bear, and you poke it, and then you're shocked when its claws come out and it mauls you. And a matter of fact, Francois told me recently when I talked to him that um, he says he remembers that at times when he's like tempted to like poke at her, that he's poking the bear and not to do that. But some people, they just, they cause strife and then they're shocked when there are problems. The Bible's very clear. We're to be careful how we treat each other, how we act. Here's the thing. Sometimes someone has hurt us. And so to us, we're just getting them back. They gossiped, you gossip back. They, they do something and you hurt them back. And now as far as you're concerned, you're even. But often to them, they don't even really think of the first thing that they did. And now they're just plotting revenge on you. Strife leads to more strife. And here's the thing. 
it ruins our testimony of Christ. If someone sees that we love revenge, and yet later we talk about, oh, we're to forgive. Jesus wants us to forgive. You're going to be like, what? You don't do that. So we need to be very careful because that kind of attitude, the revenge will destroy us. It doesn't just hurt the other person. It will hurt our soul. It will hurt who we are. According to Edward Barnes in Time Magazine back in 1994, during the Civil War in Bosnia, there was a Sarajevo man named Pipo. He was a Bosnian sniper who shot 325 people for the sake of revenge. Before becoming a sniper, he was a partner in a restaurant with a Muslim man. The two were friends and they were partners until Pipo's mother was jailed and then beaten by Muslims. He recalls, when she got out, she wouldn't talk about it. And that's when I picked up a gun and I began shooting Muslims. I hate them. But killing for revenge has changed him. He says, all I know how to do is kill. I'm not sure I'm normal anymore. I can talk to people, but if someone pushes me, I will kill them. After shooting 325 people, he says he has no more fear, no remorse, no feelings at all. He said, I went to see my mother in Belgrade and she hugged me and I felt nothing. I have no life anymore. I go from day to day, but nothing means anything. I don't want a wife and children. I don't want to think. He got revenge. He's destroyed people's lives, but he's also destroyed his own life in doing it. You can't always stop people from hating you, but you don't have to hate them back. You can't make people love you, but you can love them back. Here in Romans 12, Paul says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Proverbs 20 says it this way, do not say, I'll pay you back for this wrong. Wait for the Lord and he will deliver you. And ultimately, that's what it comes down to. Do you trust God enough to take care of the situation? Do you trust God enough to say, Lord, you're in charge and I'm going to let you repay? I'm going to let you take care of this. You can't make people love you but you can allow God's love to flow through you, and that's what we're called to do. C.S. Lewis hit it on the head, though, when he said, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive, right? When you need forgiven, isn't forgiveness a great thing? But you got to forgive? Not, not so great after all. It's been said that true forgiveness is hard to extend because it demands we let go of something we, re we value, which is the right to repay. So, what do you need to let go of right now? Who do you need to let off the hook? Who's God calling you to forgive? Verse 17 continues, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Now, it's easy to misunderstand this statement. This does not mean that you have to do what everybody else says you have to do all the time. That's not it. But what it's calling us to do is live such holy lives, lives that resemble Christ, that that when people see us, they see Christ in us. That they see that what we're doing is right, is good. Note the word to be careful to do this. This means to take thought beforehand. So we need to be prepared. Things in life are going to come. Are we living in such a way? Are we so filled with the Spirit of Christ? Is His Word so embedded in us because we're studying it? That when these things happen, we respond correctly because Christ is in us working. Too many of us live haphazard lives when God wants us to be prepared to walk in his ways. Paul says we're to do what's right. This word could be translated as beautiful or precious. That when people see our lives, they just go, wow, there's just something about them. There's just this difference in them that I see. Here's the principle. Live in such a way that no one can make an honest accusation against you. Live so that if they're going to accuse you, they will have to tell a lie to do it. The Apostle Paul was careful with how he lived. He wanted to honor God, but he also didn't want to cause stumbling blocks for others. And so he was careful with an offering that had been given to him. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we read this. We want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift churches had given generously. For we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of man. Now, ultimately, our job is not to make others impressed with us, but we should be living in such a way that, that we're not going to do things that might look questionable, that might look shady. Maybe there's nothing wrong with them, but to others, there would appear to be 
something wrong, something unethical. So if that's the case, then we shouldn't do that. We need to be, live our lives as an open book. Here at Grace Alliance, our finances are an open book. We don't hide what we do with our money. Uh, if you want to see our treasurer, Dave Hill, he'll happily show you what we spend our money on. We open our books because literally we have nothing to hide. How about you? Is your life an open book? If people looked closely, what would they find? Paul's saying that we must be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone, and that's not easy. It requires integrity. It requires understanding what our Heavenly Father wants and watching what we do. You know, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can fool God none of the time. He always knows. So what do people see when they look at your life? Does your integrity, does your goodness bring glory to God? A referee from New York wrote, I was refereeing a league championship basketball game in New Rochelle, New York, between New Rochelle and Yonkers High School. The gym was crowded to capacity. The volume of the noise made it impossible to hear. Yonkers was leading by one point, he said, when I looked up at the clock and I saw there was 30 seconds to go. With time running out, New Rochelle, the home team, pushed the ball up the court, took a shot, and the ball rolled around the rim and then rolled out. But then one of New Rochelle's players managed to tap it in, and he said, I looked up and I saw that the time was at zero. So New Rochelle is celebrating, the team's out there on the court, they won, and he goes to the other referee and says, like, was that tapped in, you know, was the game still going on? And the other referee's like, I don't know, I didn't see it either. So then they went over to the timekeeper, who was a young man of about 17 years old. And he said this, he said, the buzzer went off as the ball was rolling off the rim before the final tap-in was made. So this referee says, now I'm in this unbelievable position of going to the coach of the home team and saying, your team actually lost. That tip-in was not made in time. So he says, I went and told the coach the time had run out, that Yonkers had won the game. He said the coach's face clouded over. And then the young timekeeper came up and he said, I'm sorry, Dad. The time ran out before the final basket. And he said, suddenly, like the sun coming out from behind a cloud, the coach's face lit up. And he said, that's okay, son. You, do what you, you did what you had to do, and I'm proud of you. Turning to me, he said, Al, I want you to meet my son, Joe. And he said then the two of them walked off the court with the father's arm around his son. That's integrity. That's what this passage is talking about. Being careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. That kid would have been a hero. If he had told his friends the game was over and I told them it wasn't and we won, he would have been a hero. They would have been like, that's really bad. That's not good ethics. That's bad morals. No way. They would have loved him for it. We need to do what's right because people might have liked him for it, but they also would have known this is someone we can't trust. This is someone who does not have integrity. Are you living your life in such a way that if people have to accuse you, it's of something that they're wrong about? Are you living up to what God has challenged you to do? None of these things Paul has talked about here in Romans chapter 12 are easy. Bless those who persecute us. I mean, it's one thing to put up with people who persecute us. But we're called to bless them? That doesn't make any sense. We're to rejoice with people who are rejoicing? That's often not easy. Mourn with those who mourn? That's so not fun to do. And it takes a lot out of us. We're to be humble. We're not to be exalt ourselves we're not to seek revenge that goes against what our culture teaches us doing what is right all the time it seems impossible but all of these things are possible if we allow god to change our character if we allow the spirit of christ to work on our heart and if we surrender to his work so let me ask you are you allowing god to change you will you ask him to help this passage be true in your life that these things would be who you are. Living in harmony is not an easy thing. Harmonizing is not an easy thing. Singing melody, very easy. The singer, like when I'm playing my guitar, I can sing melody, no problem. Uh, literally 10% of my brain is thinking about what it's singing. Most of it's on the guitar. Um, and then occasionally I'm like, ooh, who's that walking in? And normally if I make a mistake on guitar, it's because like I just, oh, what's going on over there? Um, but very little of my mind needs to work on melody. 
Harmony is a totally different thing, and you will only hear me harmonizing on hymns, where typically hymns stylistically a little bit easier, the harmonies are typically a little bit easier, but with harmony, the thing is you have to listen for what other people are doing. So when you're harmonizing, it's figuring out what works. And when I first came here, my previous church, there were songs that were played in a certain way by our accompanist. And I learned a harmony, just kind of figured it out from the hymnal. Those, I'm not going to explain what those are to those who are younger. Something called a hymnal, it's this weird thing old people use. Um, but the hymnal would show you the notes, and I would learn the harmony. And I came here, and there were times when my harmonies didn't work because we play it differently, and different notes are being done. And so I would have to adjust. Because to harmonize, you can't just decide, like, I'm going to sing this, because it may sound wrong. Anyone ever heard bad harmony? Crosby, Stills, and Nash were one of the 70s group known for their harmonies. Like, they are tight and beautiful harmonies, and they've got this uh, song that I absolutely love um, that's titled Slipping My Mind, honey, Southern Cross. Um, a beautiful song. The harmonies are so tight. And so a couple weeks ago, I said, Debbie, I haven't heard that song in a long time. And so she pulled it up on Spotify, and it was terrible. It, I mean, it really, it was bad. Like, the, the singer's voice wasn't very good. And then it got to, like, the chorus, and the harmony was just like, ouch. And I said, that's not right, honey. I'm like, you know, hand me, she's giving me her phone. I'm like, it's them. It's just them older. And someone has lost their ability to harmonize. And I'm not kidding. This gorgeous song is terrible. Like, it's painfully bad. To live in harmony with others, you have to listen to them. You have to be aware of them. It's not just about you. Well, this is what I like to do. Well, but what's God calling you to do? Man, this stuff Paul's talked about, that's all hard. None of this is possible if we do not allow God's work in us. None of this is possible if we're not willing to surrender to the work of Christ daily and let him change us. But through his power, these things can become who we are if we'll allow him to work in us. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for being a God who wants to transform us. I'm grateful, Lord, that you don't expect us to fix ourselves. Because, Lord, on our own, we are broken and we can't fix ourselves. Lord, first of all, I pray for anyone here today who's not a follower of Christ, anyone who's never received the gift of your love, that they would understand that there's a Savior who gave his life on the cross for them that they would know that you love them more than they can understand and that you want to do a transforming work in them if they will surrender their lives and their sin to you and receive the gift of your life. Father, I pray for those here today, Lord, those of us who know you, and yet, Father, when we look at a list like this, we realize how far short we fall. Lord, blessing those who persecute us, that seems impossible. Lord, rejoicing when others get something we wish we had. Lord, that's so hard. Giving up on revenge, doing what is good so that others see your glory. Lord, we can't do this, and so we admit that this morning. And Lord, today we ask your spirit to come and do a new work in us. Father, help us to surrender all that we are to you, that you would be glorified in us and that people would see Christ's love and his goodness through our lives. And Jesus, we would pray this in your name. Amen.